So there's some people out there that are not sure whether to convert your camera raw files into DNGs so that you can work on them in post-processing. So in other words, should you be working with your camera's native raw file format or should you be using DNG? So let's go through that in this video and give you the answers. So firstly, let's talk about the camera's raw file format. So every camera brand has its own raw file format. So for instance, Canon will have CR2 and CR3 now, I believe. Uh, Nikon's raw files are called NEFs. Fuji's, I think, are called RAFs. And uh, funnily enough, a DJI drone, their raw files, when you take pictures with them, are actually DNGs already. And I think that's the first thing to get out of the way. A DNG is a raw file. It's a raw file just as much as a CR2 is, an NEF is, etc. And what DNG stands for is digital negative. So a DNG is a raw file, but it's a generic raw file. It's an open source raw file, if you like. So Canon own CR2s or whatever, where a DNG is an open source one. You know, anyone can use it. So if you are doing photography properly, shall we say, you will generally be shooting in RAW. And the reason for that is you've got much more detail, you've got much more latitude, is what we call it, to play around with when it comes to post-processing. Now, what you can do in post-processing programs like Lightroom is convert your camera RAW file format into a digital negative format, DNG. And there's lots of benefits in converting your RAW files into DNGs. There's a few cons as well, and that's what we're gonna talk about now. So DNGs are generic RAW files, like I've said, they're digital negatives. What that actually means is that you can open them up in any imaging program. So any imaging program that can process RAW files will open up and allow you to use DNGs. Now that's beneficial because if you're working on your files now and then in 10 years time, you might wanna go back to them files and you're not using Lightroom anymore or whatever, a DNG will still open up and you will still be able to work on it. The other thing it will do is if you're using different cameras, so let's just say that you've moved from a Canon to a Nikon, so you've got some CR2s and you've got some NEFs, if you're converting them to DNGs, they're obviously all gonna be unified. They also speed up the process when you're working from Lightroom to Photoshop, all right? Now that is really slight, and if you've got a fast computer, you're probably not even gonna notice it, but it will speed up the process working between Lightroom and Photoshop if they're the programs you are working with. Now there's a few blogs or whatever that you wanna read out there that may say that you can lose some data when you convert your RAW file to a DNG. Never in my whole career have I ever seen any loss in quality between a camera raw file, its native raw file, and a DNG conversion. For argument's sake, when it comes to the process inside, it's going to be exactly the same whether you use a camera raw native file or a DNG file. What you could lose though, is any camera specific data that is specific to that brand. So Nikon have these fancy picture profiles that Adobe don't have. So if you've put that on your camera as you're shooting and then you import it into Lightroom, Lightroom's not gonna pick that up, okay? So you will lose any camera specific data, but it's, it's literally silly little things like picture profiles. And in my opinion, when camera brands do that, what they're trying to do is keep you working within their software. That's my opinion, you know, and you can think what you want. Now, when making edits in a post-processing program, let's just say that you are gonna change the contrast, the saturation, the highlights, etc. When you make those edits on a camera raw file, it's native file, like a CR2, etc. The settings are held in a separate sidecart file called an XMP. So you will have your raw file and then sitting next to that raw file, you'll have a separate XMP file that's holding all of the settings that you've changed on that raw file. Now clearly when you open up a folder of images, that 
could look a bit more confusing to you because you're going to have your raw files you're going to have your xmp files you may well have shot raw and jpeg together so you'll have that as well so for one raw file you've got three files okay you've got the raw file the xmp and the jpeg if you're using your camera raw native file now if you're converting your images to dngs and you make settings contrast saturation etc those settings are held directly within the dng file no separate sidecar file is being made now personally it might be my ocd-ness but i like that i like the fact that everything is held within that one raw file you know there is less room for error shall we say you know you've got less files to muck up all right so you with an xmp you've got an extra file there that extra file can get deleted it can get moved you know you know what happens on computers things do happen so for me keeping everything into one dng file it just makes it all nice and neat and it makes me think that there's going to be less room for error if i do that and a dng is an archival digital imaging format now what do i mean by that I mean it can be archived so in 20 years time someone can open up your dng and it will be exactly how you saved it 20 years ago it's like a jpeg you know i can open up a jpeg from 1995 and it's going to look like it did in 1995 the dng is an archival file format whereas your camera raw file so let's just say canon again and let's say the cr2 in 20 years time the cr2 canon raw file format is probably going to be well obsolete i mean currently they're coming out with cr3s for instance so you imagine 20 years time that archival file you might not be around let's face it right in 20 years time and someone wants to open up your image file they might have trouble because it's not an archival file format whereas a DNG is. So it does have that benefit. A DNG is an archival image file format. So let's get down to uh, one of the cons that floats around the internet. And that is that if you convert your pictures into DNG, you can't prove that you are the original owner of that file. It's just a load of codswallop. If someone steals your image, should we say, off the internet, firstly, it's going to be a jpeg image off the internet because you cannot put raw files visually on on a on a web page it can't happen and if that is the case then it's going to be a lower res jpeg because it's on a website and then if you think about that there is no way on earth that someone's going to take a jpeg off of a website and then convert it back into a full size dng raw file it's just not going to happen it can't happen people can attempt it and they can do interpolation it's called with the pixels but it will just look terrible. And as soon as you get the original raw file up against whatever they've made, it's absolutely gonna be a no brainer, right? So you cannot take a JPEG off of the internet and turn it back into the original raw file. It's just not gonna happen. The other thing that floats around is about competitions. Now, any decent competition provider, if you like, realizes that a DNG is a conversion of the original raw file. It's still got the same data. It's gonna have all the metadata in it. It's gonna have all your copyright information in it. If you know how to do that, if you don't, come and check our Lightroom course out because I teach you how to write the copyright data within the image. So you've got all of that, which is in the original DNG, okay? So there is no way that a decent competition provider, shall we say, is not going to accept a dng conversion of a raw file unless of course they haven't got an absolute clue about how photographers deal with raw files and their images now having said all of that it is your choice you do not have to convert dngs you can carry on working with your camera at raw files when it comes to the end result it's not going to have any difference anyway but here's the reason why i do it dngs are also smaller files as well i forgot to mention that earlier on so a dng will be a slightly smaller file than your camera's native raw file 
Now, if we're thinking 10, 20 images, it's not really gonna make much difference. But if we're talking 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 raw files, if they've all been converted into DNGs, you are gonna start saving some serious disk space. So that's one reason why I do it. I also do it because of the XMP thing, which I told you earlier, all of the settings are held within that raw file so I can open it up in 10, 20 years time. It's all gonna be there. It doesn't matter what program I open it on neither because you never know. In 20 years time, there might be a, a different Lightroom program that's doing the rounds, you know. So if I've got everything in a DNG, I can open that up in any program at any time. All my settings are gonna be there and it's all gonna be lovely. And I work with different cameras. Fuji's, Canon's, uh, Olympus cameras I've got as well. And for me, I, I just like it. I like converting them all into DNG so they're all, you know, uniform, but that's something personal to me. So hopefully, you know, that's educated you a little bit on the differences between a DNG and a camera raw file. If you wanna learn more about processing these raw files, you wanna learn more about photography and actually taking decent exposures, come over and see us at theschoolofphotography.com. We have got literally thousands of educational videos, worksheets to download, raw files for you guys to use, presets, etc. And we're known for teaching photography properly. So if you wanna learn photography, Lightroom, Photoshop, or anything to do with photography, in fact, come over and see us at theschoolofphotography.com. Apart from that, please like this video and share it with your friends. Give us a comment, tell us your theory on DNGs and raw files. Have you benefited from turning your files into DNGs? Do you prefer doing it the other way for a reason? You know, tell us, put it in the comments and tell us your thoughts. So I do hope this video has helped you out and I hope to see you in the next one. And remember, if you wanna learn photography properly, come over and see us at theschoolofphotography.com.